Hello and welcome to the last day of the i3D conference this year. My name is Michael Doggett and I'll be hosting the first session this morning. The program for today consists of a keynote and three paper sessions before we close the conference and announce the six best paper and poster awards. After the awards, we will have our last social on gather, so please join us for that. So to start off the day today, we have a keynote from Morgan Maguire. He's currently the chief scientist at Roblox, where it turns out 17 years ago, he worked as a contractor writing the original rendering code. Morgan has made extensive contributions in computer graphics, including running this conference I3D multiple times and many more contributions than we have time to go through now. So I'm just gonna go through a few of the things that he has in his bio. So Morgan has worked on video games, cloud graphics, esports, ray tracing, and augmented and virtual reality. His work spans NVIDIA GPUs, the Skylanders and Titan Quest video game series, the Unity game engine, the e-ink display used in the Amazon Kindle, the Bible of 3D computer graphics, principles and practice third edition, the graphics codex, and the MarkDeep document system. Morgan holds faculty positions at the University of Waterloo, and McGill University and was a full professor at Williams College. Today, Morgan's talk will give us some insights into a very hot topic at the moment, the metaverse, where he will discuss some of the unique technical challenges for Roblox's present and future. And these challenges come from the combination of the constraints from real-time 3D performance, which we all know, the social global media scale and 100% user-generated content. So as a reminder, you can ask questions during the presentation in the Discord channel or on YouTube, and we'll have a live Q&A session after the talk. Okay. Switch over to Morgan. Okay. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, it's always a, a pleasure to be back at I3D. I think I3D was actually the first conference uh, in graphics that I, I ever um, attended a, a, as a researcher and, and as a graduate student in 2005. Um, and so it's, it's wonderful to be back and you know, kind of a dream come true to, to get to give an invited talk here. So thank you very much for having me. All of you, are experts in interactive 3D. So I think what's interesting about today's talk is the spin and qualification I'm going to put on it, which is interactive 3D at global scale. Roblox is a set of interactive multiplayer 3D experiences. These are all created by the players themselves, and they vary from simple VR chat rooms to full-blown fantasy role-playing settings and, and traditional game-like experiences. Each of those experiences is what we call its own content universe, just like a book or a movie or a game defines its own universe, like the Marvel content universe. And Roblox links all of these separate game universes created by others um, with a consistent avatar, consistent persona, friends list, economy, inventory, um, even user interface conventions and currency. So that connection between the universes creates what we call a metaverse of content. And you can move between them instead of starting fresh with a new state and new character in each one. It's like if you had a 3D VR version of the web, but where all websites had a common login and a common wallet across them. This vision is straight from the science fiction that I grew up in, um, you know, fantastic books and movies. And I've dreamed of, of sort of working on systems like this, like most of you have. And what I'm describing though is not, no longer aspirational. This is real. Um, as, as Mike mentioned, uh, Roblox went live 16 years ago. Um, it's grown tremendously in that time. We now serve a quarter of a billion people every month. Um, they're around the world, they're speaking different languages, they're on different devices, whether those are mobile phones, VR headsets, desktops, consoles, laptops, tablets, and crucially, millions of those players are also creating their own interactive 3D content, whether it's art or code or whole experiences. And so in today's talk, what I'm going to do 
is demonstrate global scale through a diversity of experiences in the scope of the business and platform of Roblox, describe the unique constraints of managing a 3D environment at that scale, explain how at Roblox, we've innovated to address some of those um, constraints in our actual production work, and then pose three new grand research challenges for the metaverse to you, the i3D audience. And let's begin by looking at some experiences in the video clip. This is all real time, it's all in-engine capture, and except for about three seconds that Roblox produced, it's all user-generated content. And that's all user-generated content. Roblox provides a platform and tools, but everything on Roblox is created by the amazing developers on our platform. In the video, I emphasized um, some of the exciting game-like experiences. There are a lot of different kinds of experiences on the platform as well. For example, we've had concerts by popular musicians. These tend to have millions of fans attending, sometimes in a single weekend. Um, we have experiences by major brands, and that's across fashion, food, sports, all kinds of popular culture. And then some radically creative new forms of interactive 3D that were invented by our community. Um, for example, on the lower right, this uh, purple shot of Vibe Plane, um, that's an experience which is quiet and contemplative. It's a place where kids can go and just kind of hang out without talking to each other. To, get, to be sort of alone together, to get a sense of, of social safety and sort of being in a playground, but when you don't feel like interacting. Um, that was really helpful during the pandemic, we found. Uh, Tiefel's library in the upper right, that's a player created library and every single book in it is real and written by another player. So it's this like massive amounts of online writing community all coming together there. Um, and even work environments. So on the lower left is the digital twin of our real headquarters in San Mateo. And it's accurate down to every tree and conference room. And we use it because we have 1,200 employees and there's both uh, no physical room on campus big enough for us in terms of uh, how big we've gotten. So it's great for, um, you know, when we want to get the whole company together with a, with a sense of purpose, but we're remote uh, or local. 
And during the pandemic, it was really helpful to sort of bring on new people, but give them a sense of place and sort of make it embodied when they're coming to work. Um, and now many universities and even first robotics competition have adopted Roblox as an educational platform for many of the same reasons. So there are millions of these kinds of experiences, pieces of multimedia content on the platform. Um, you can think of that as that's the content supply. And the demand has sort of comparable scope. Um, this is the quantification of the business aspects that I, I mentioned at the very beginning. Um, 4 billion hours per month, 250 million uh, players per month, and so on. About half our players are over 13 and about half are under 13. That's sort of milestone we passed in the last year. Uh, as, as we're aging up the player base. And the players are equally distributed between uh, Europe, US and Canada, Asia Pacific, and then the rest of the world with 45 natural languages supported. So it's mostly outside of North America at this point as well. The business model of Roblox is an economy of virtual goods. And we pass much of the revenue on from that economy to the creators of the goods themselves. And we have very strong privacy controls and we don't sell player data or use target advertising. It's solely the virtual economy is, is where we make our money. In terms of technology scope, Roblox runs on almost any uh, player client device, um, you know, five-year-old Android phones, low-end tablets, uh, up to high-end enthusiast desktops, and it automatically scales all the content for those. We have thousands of our own servers. They're in 20 global data centers worldwide. And we build and control that stack uh, down to bare metal. It's not running on top of someone else's um, virtualization platform. For uh, the software, it's sort of a union of strong moderation because we need to ensure civility and safety among our player base and especially protect the under 13 group. And then we have real-time 3D servers and clients for the embodied interaction, um, trying to minimize latency, obviously maximize frame rate, and then massive databases that connect everything to make it persistent as well as consistent across them. So that is global scale. And you can probably imagine some of the constraints that we hit, um, and they're very different from traditional online games or desktop software. We think this is the future for a lot of graphics, not just Roblox. So first of all, all of our content is user generated. Um, it has to be. <laughs> so no one company could produce this much content and we don't want to produce this much content. To create the social 3D world, to create a metaverse, that needs to be created by everyone in order to be for everyone. And 100% user-generated content is sort of a, a wonderful thing in terms of vision and values. It's a huge challenge in terms of technology because it means we have highly, highly variable content. Um, that can go from their professional teams with you know, professionally trained artists and, and using tools. Um, down to first day novices who've just you know, made their first CSG object with, with a couple of cubes and spheres. And so for all that content, um, we have to achieve constant frame rates uh, for physics, for rendering, for simulation. Um, but we can't, unlike traditional game development, um, we can't put any bound on object count, on lights, on materials, on animations, um, even scripting cycles for the code. Um, there's sort of no limits that we place on the players. And we also run full physics. So if you see a, a wall made out of bricks, every one of those bricks can be a, a real object that's independently simulated and dynamically aggregated. There's a car, it can have a full gear train in it. Um, and so, so it's a really, really difficult challenge doing this on uncontrolled content. On the servers themselves, there could be as few as one or as many of hundreds of players um, all interacting with each other. And each of them can have custom avatars and animations. So they're not instances of, of a common object. That is a lot of data to synchronize and we have to do it in real time. And some of it like spatial audio propagation within the 3D world, that's naively gonna be order n squared in the number of players because every player hears a different mix of sounds coming from the other players. So huge, huge scaling challenge, both in terms of constant factors and asymptotically. And finally, to connect the world in a responsible way as a platform, we want to ensure that we have um, all the assets, all the communication interaction between players need to be moderated in ways that are appropriate for different age groups and for different cultures. So we don't just wanna put a lot of triangles on the screen. We need to do it in a way that's safe and civil foremost. And the way that you do that isn't one size fits all around the world. So we need to do different things in different areas for moderation to be culturally appropriate. So I think this is the new frontier for interactive 3D graphics to operate at global scale. So I'll share a few of our recent results in this space. 
um, many of which are, are now in production. And then I'm gonna reframe each of them as a general grand challenge for the research community that we should all be exploring together, I believe. I'll start with our clothing system. So the, the layer clothing system, this just shipped about two weeks ago. Um, we've been talking about it for a while in the tech, underlying technology. It lets you put any clothes on top of any other clothes, um, correctly simulate that, map it to any characters. The clothing will dynamically change uh, size and shape and volume, and it'll track any animation as well. Um, so that's a really hard generalization challenge for cloth. And the way we've implemented this, under this um, behind the scenes is we have a cage mesh and that's transferring deformations using radial basis functions um, down to sort of vertex weights for skinning. And it's relatively efficient. So even on our lowest end mobile device um, with 2000 vertices and a mesh, we can, we can transform that in about 1.8 milliseconds. Um, so that's plenty fast enough to sort of handle at least the, the player's own character. Um, a big challenge is we just shipped this. We have 16 years of content though. Uh, we were able to do this in a backwards compatible way where 99.8% of the top 10,000 experiences um, worked out of the box when we released the clothing. So all of a sudden in those existing experiences, the clothes got a lot better, the animation got better, no manual patching was required. Um, and there are, you know, one of the, the key parts of the solution is, is what's here shown on screen, which is we pre-compute hidden surface data per triangle by ray casting. And that ensures the clothing never interpenetrates under animation. And that's really key when you have many, many layers to not have different pieces of clothes as they're animating and simulating, poking through each other to provide realism. Text processing, so totally different direction. Um, all text is, is, is moderated when players are chatting with each other. And we had previously used sort of classic natural language processing um, and non-deep neural net uh, MLs is sort of the way moderation had been working for many, many years. And what was a real breakthrough for us was uh, research by others that released um, both the BERT system and then the distilled BERT, slightly more efficient version more recently. And we saw, an, when we adopted that, we saw an instant 20% uh, improvement compared to our previous techniques. And then we took that research and we adapted it to run at global scale so that it wasn't just you know, running on a server, but it was, it was running in real time and we could do it efficiently for the scale that we have. Um, so we had to train it in 45 languages in order to work around the world, so being truly global. But then we optimized nearly every aspect of um, that system in order to make it practical for deployment. And we're now serving uh, over a billion daily requests using BERT, um, which is this, this DNN transformer model. And our work on this is described in the conference talk cited there, as well as the two books listed at the bottom. And we're also pushing into localization. So traditional game and application development programs are localized, translated by human translators. And that, that doesn't scale for user-generated content, of course. We can't have human beings looking at every single thing that's created. Um, so in Roblox, we use a, a context-aware natural language translation of text within each experience via a programming interface. That means as a developer, you can create signage, instructions, um, whole user interfaces in, in one language, and every player will automatically see them converted into their own language. And that's AI driven. Um, the translation algorithm is not unique. We're using off the shelf techniques there. What our contribution is, is deploying that platform wide and automating it so that everything can be localized naturally. That's sort of a the, the sort of true hitchhiker's guide, babblefish kind of idea. Um, just creating either our content or player content uh, at this scale, massive software engineering challenge. And so we've innovated there as well. Um, one really exciting thing we do is we push a new release of our engine to all of our players every single week. Um, and that's not necessarily a small patch or bug fix. That's we grab the top of tree from version control. There's hundreds of developers contributing and we push that out to all the players. Um, and those, all those millions of pieces of user generated content to going back 16 years that automatically it has to run, like we have to be completely backwards compatible. We can't patch that stuff. Um, and you know how most game engines, you know, we were in version four and 4.5 and version five, we have a long-term service written and Roblox only has one version and that version is latest. That, like that's it, everything always runs and it always works on the latest API. Um, so this is a really unique way of, of deploying a system and obviously it has huge amounts of risk if it wasn't handled very carefully. So what we've built is a system that lets us flag every single change in the binary and do it separately 
so that we can selectively enable them at runtime. So we push out a binary, it has a, a lot of dormant code in it that we can turn on. And in some cases that code isn't even fully tested. We can, we can do the deployment because we're trying to get to players around the world um, in parallel with asynchronously running the tests. When the tests pass, we can turn on those features for a tiny fraction of the, the user base, like a like tenth of a percent, and use telemetry to make sure that it's working as intended, and then roll out to everyone. And if we find a problem in production, we can actually disable the bad code remotely without even having to, to restart the app. So, so we, can, we can fix things as they're running for players. And that allows us to move very, very flexibly with a huge feature set because we don't have to go through the sort of you know, months of certification kind of process for every release and every patch. We can move very quickly, we can innovate quickly. And then if there's a problem, we can immediately claw it back and, and fix it without affecting players. Um, one, so for, we have this programming language, Lua, which is our um, open source extension of, of another language called Lua. And um, it has an optimizing compiler chain, all, all this great stuff we've released. Like Scheme and Python and JavaScript, this is a dynamically typed language. And that creates a big problem for developer environment tools. Um, for example, you can't autocomplete the properties and methods of an object based on its declared type because programmers don't declare types in a dynamic language. And so what happens is we have novice programmers, we wanna provide really rich tools for things like refactoring and autocomplete, but we can't do it because most of those are driven by type systems. So for static analysis and execution, advanced compilers like ours will run a type inference algorithm and then it can report type errors even for dynamic languages and we do that. But you can only run traditional type analysis um, and type inference when the program's complete. So that, that's an error checking system. It isn't available to in IDE, IDE tools where you're writing the program. And so you don't have a complete program. So the traditional type inference algorithms won't work. They'll just say the program is broken because it's not complete. So we built a completely new kind of type inference system. And that's able to robustly infer types on incomplete programs. And then for the first time using that, we're able to assign plausible types and expose them to all of our IDE plugins and tools for a dynamically typed language. And that's described in the publications at the bottom. Um, so I'm gonna go quickly through some of the other examples. I wanted to give you those first ones to just get a sense of the diversity of things beyond graphics that affect a 3D environment like compiler technology. Um, so we talked about this actually at, at SIGGRAPH uh, 21, our facial animation system. So this is in order to give natural controls for 3D interaction um, for your avatar, we map a real-time video feed from a webcam, uh, and we take the audio that's coming from the voice chat. So if your face is partly obscured, we can, we can infer from the voice as well, and then map that into real-time 3D facial expressions for the avatars. And that provides the expressiveness of the video chat, of something like Zoom, but also the privacy and the consistent visuals of working with a rendered avatar. Because we're at global scale, that means it's not just my desktop webcam, it's all kinds of physical environments. It could be indoor, outdoor. The camera could be below because it's on a phone. It could be above. Um, we have you know, the full diversity of, of all the humans on the planet that we want to be able to support and all their devices and, and all the complicated situations that arise in the wild. So we have a whole DNN system based on this. Um, and that's, that's what was shown in the SIGGRAPH talk, so I'm not going to describe the details. Um, What's neat is it maps it to traditional animation controls, and we've managed to get it running fast enough that even on mobile devices, we can run the whole neural net directly on the device. And so that means that in addition to running physics and rendering, we're also able to do pretty sophisticated uh, computer vision processing right on the device, which means we only need to send the animation, these so-called FACS, sort of a classic um, muscle motor encoding scheme, for the face, we only need to send that to the server to other players. So it helps with scaling as well. We can give the animation without having to send the full video or having to do the processing on the server. Um, and there's some work we've been doing, uh, and I've actually been personally involved in some of this, on um, neural representations for geometry and scenes. So trying to find ways to connect AI machine learning technology um, directly to 3D representations beyond meshes. NERF is, is one of the big neural radiance fields um, is one of the big breakthroughs in that area by others. And what we wanted to do was capture some of the benefits of NERF without sort of the, the brute force 
voxel radiance aspect of it. And so we've actually been training neural nets to build sine distance functions. And this is um, one of the reasons I wanted to bring this, this work up is not the result itself, but the fact that this is a collaboration between University of Toronto, McGill, NVIDIA, Adobe Research, and Roblox. And so it's a great sort of cross-university, cross-industry lab effort to sort of find, you know, what's the future of geometry? And um, I'm pleased to announce that we have it coming up at SIGGRAPH 22, uh, Tawaki um, Takikawa, one of the main uh, students on this project, is going to be presenting a paper that's sort of the new version, which has, I think, 10x better compression for streaming. And we have uh, materials now uh, baked into that system. So all of this work is being done uh, across Roblox by about 800 engineers, but then also uh, 50 PhD level scientists, R&D leads and interns. And that includes both applied scientists, for example, in our data analytics and user design group, the R&D leads in engineering, and then folks whose methodology is similar to your own. So fundamental academic style Roblox research team. And on the Roblox research team, we have very long horizons sort of three to five years um, to shipping. We do peer reviewed publishing, release open source and data. And as I just pointed out, um, we believe strongly in academic and even cross industry collaboration. So our mandate on the fundamental research team is to tackle three problems. And these are the ones I'm gonna to pose to you as the grand challenges in closing. Um, they are scaling player density, and that's gonna be a distributed systems approach, community support, um, lots of NLP, lots of computer vision, and creativity. And that spans everything from you know, proc gen and techniques that, that folks like us work on um, to other areas like compilers that have shown. So let me detail those three grand challenges for you. First one is scaling player density per server. Um, I mentioned we have concerts on Roblox today attended by millions of people, but for performance reasons, we separate them into many parallel server instances and each one only has a few hundred players each. So you don't have the full sense that there are, you're at a giant festival or giant concert. It feels like you're an intimate nightclub, even though there are millions of other people experiencing the same thing, you can't interact with them. And that's, that's a sharding system like the way MMOs and, and other traditional games have worked. And we wanna be able to capture uh, the energy of being in an arena or a giant space battle, that sort of the fact there are millions of people on the platform, there's sometimes we should actually be able to experience that directly. 3D games haven't previously hit this, because they clamp the number of players low and they tend to use fixed 3D models or at least instances. Whereas when you go to metaverse tech, you wanna have player created content. And so you might have a million players and they all have completely unique avatars. There's no sharing uh, whatsoever. You can't even keep it in core in some cases. Um, and generally uh, they don't do 3D simulation on voice chat. So the audio aspect alone, um, this is that N squared thing becomes seriously problematic when you have large numbers of players. And then also we're trying to do real-time face and hand tracking. So, so the animation is, is a completely dynamic system. And amazing client-side advances got interactive graphics to the point where today it, it's commonplace for games to have maybe a hundred players in them. Um, but now we need to go to tens of thousands. And I, I deeply believe the only way to achieve that uh, is not on the client side, but on the server side now. And that it's, there's a major distributed systems challenge that's going to happen in the server room that involve aggregation and persistent services and all kinds of load balancing. And that we'll still have the great things that we have today for client side, um, but the client side rendering will be fed from the server simplifying the scene dynamically. Communication, our second grand challenge. Um, so here's an example of what I, I would love to see for the, the future of, of communication in the metaverse. So. Here we have a kid, they're, they're playing on a tablet, they're playing a game, I think this is Adopt Me on Roblox. And they say to someone else, hey, I just bought the shirt, do you like my shirt? And the problem is the person they're talking to maybe doesn't speak English, maybe they, they speak Portuguese. Um, and so we would love to have this automatically translate, not text chat, speech being translated between natural languages in real time in your own voice. So it doesn't sound like a robot and with content moderation. So we can make sure it's still civil and safe. Um, so this is a grand challenge. There's some signs that we're sort of about two orders of magnitude off from being able to do this as a research community. And so that's the point where I believe, yeah, in five years, we might be able to start getting serious traction on that. Um, but it's still a really hard problem. And I think the same system that does moderation should also be proactively trying to help with constructive social interaction. 
So maybe while it's doing this, it's going to have enough semantics to be able to make suggestions to you, like suggesting ways you might want to engage with others to make them feel good or telling you, you know, the way you phrase that might not be appropriate for this environment. So I, I think moderation is more than just preventing bad things. I think it should also be about creating good things. And finally, empowering 3D content creation, creativity. So there's a wonderful line of research um, by others in the graphics literature on parameterized 3D models, for example. And these are usually based on rule systems, like what I'm, I'm showing on the right from Eurographics. And these promise a kind of friendly to novices, high level 3D modeling beyond individual primitives. So I can just stretch buildings and, and good things happen and they automatically adapt and windows appear and stuff. Um, so the wonderful thing about this research is it would make it much more natural to make 3D models than, than moving vertices or something. Uh, the drawback is that the way these systems have traditionally been built, there's no way a novice could author a new parameterized model in the first place. So there's that line of work that I've been following for a long time and really excited about for sort of procedural generation parameterized modeling. And then we also have a completely separate recent body of work um, on using, this is from the AI field and it's something called clip transformers. And you might've heard of these as other systems like Disco or Dolly or Dolly 2 uh, is sort of the way they've been presented in the press. And what these can do is they can synthesize images from text. And so that makes them appropriate for complete novices to create 2D imagery. So for example, um, with what I'm showing on screen, given the text prompt, a moving city of blocky buildings rolls like an endless train across a natural landscape concept art, Thomas Kincaid, right? It's not even grammatically correct. You give that as the prompt um, and the clip system will produce this image. And if you look closely, it doesn't quite hold up. There's some sketchy things going on with transitions, but that's, that's far beyond anything that I could ever draw by hand. And it's sort of amazing that from one grammatically ill-formed sentence, you can produce an image that looks like this amazing fantasy image, right? So that's a result that excites me that, hey, the power of neural nets and the power of transformers may enable us to do some kind of novice content creation that's incredibly powerful that bypasses all of the vertices and blend shapes and materials and lighting and somehow goes straight to the scene. So the ultimate creation environment, and, and this is my number one goal for Roblox, is to get to the point where the author can give a natural language description of a 3D scene. And then AI will synthesize geometry, materials, animation rigs, lighting, the interactive triggers and code for making things actually interact properly, the physics parameters, and then drop in non-player characters who know how to role play themselves and synthesize dialogue. And that I haven't forgotten about what was on the right, that I think that output needs to be parameterized and editable so that the author can refine it with more traditional 3D tools once they've painted the broad strokes. Um, they could either edit the text or they could go in and start saying, well, I wanted the castle to be a little bit bigger and I want this to be red instead of green. And instead of having an unstable result that gets you know, sort of hallucinated from scratch and maybe is inconsistent, that the system really has semantics and understands that's a building and these are the ways that buildings can change. So that is the grandest grand challenge I'm posing to the i3D community. So to conclude, I started by posing a new frontier for graphics at global scale and described some of the ways that Roblox has been working in that space. I described it as these three constraints, 50,000 players per instance is one of the places I'd like to go, moderated assets and user-generated content. And then I translated each of those constraints into a grand challenge for us to work on. Scaling, distributed systems and aggregation problem. How do we get to these tens of thousands of players instead of hundreds? The moderated assets, that becomes focusing on the community. Ways to do natural language processing, AI, for discovery, for translation, for moderation of content. And finally, enabling everyone to create interactive 3D. So creativity, and that spans tools, proc gen, animation, and also programming language technology. So those are the three grand challenges, scaling, community, and creativity that I'm posing to you as a metaverse research agenda. And if you're interested in investigating that, I would also invite you to do it with us. Um, so we have our research team's expertise, data and resources, and we are happy to share in open collaborations. 
Thank you very much, I3D. Thank you, Morgan, that, <clears throat> that was great. Um, let me start off with a couple of questions. So in the video you showed at the beginning, I mean, it's clear that Roblox runs on a range of platforms and in the video, you can see it's sort of delivering a different fidelity of graphics, yeah. So how do you handle that? How do you cope with that? And I mean, how much, is that a challenge or didn't come up as a challenge? So I guess you've got it all worked out. <laughs> no, it's, it's a tremendous and ongoing challenge. So we've, we've figured out a couple of things. Um, and then there's, you know, <laughs> for everything we've solved, there's probably about 10 more problems that we've uncovered as we've gone into that space. Um, so. One thing that's really interesting is we're increasingly leaning into ways for content creators to flag semantics to us. So we would, um, you know, so I would say there's an open problem. We, we, we've only dipped our toe in. Um, it would be nice to be able to indicate, hey, this light is important for gameplay and this one is cosmetic. So if you need to drop a light or bake a light or do something, drop the cosmetic one or aggregate all the cosmetic lights. Um, so that kind of information would really help to guide us. One of our big initiatives we're working on is optimizing for experience. So traditionally, we, like everyone else, has optimized for latency and frame rate and resolution. Right? They're easy to quantify, um, nice benchmarks to hit. But there are experiences where, you know, if you're in VR, maybe latency matters the most, and you don't care that much about resolution, perhaps. So maybe you'll drop the model LOD or something to, to, to get the latency. But then maybe you're playing. Um, you know, a real-time strategy game, and you don't care at all about frame rate or latency. It's you're just clicking around with your mouse, uh, but you really care about, I need every single model to be represented because they have semantic content or how exactly how many units there are in my army or something. So pushing towards sort of figuring out what's optimizing for human perception and what's optimizing for the experience are critical. And then the last thing I wanna leave you with on that question of, of how do we scale between devices is um, it was one of the th first things that, that Angela Pesci said to me um, at Roblox, this really just changed my entire view of graphics. He said, um, you know, we are not looking at rendering as it's, it's a simulation and we're trying to exactly represent on everybody's device the same thing. What we are doing is we're creating a different visualization of this shared metaverse reality that's appropriate for your device. And for some people, you know, you can imagine a device where that, that's 2D even, and then somewhere it's 3D and somewhere it's VR 3D, um, where the models are different resolution, where the lighting is different, where, you know, sometimes, you know, depending on the player's ability, maybe you're seeing text on screen versus hearing it in your ear. Um, so that notion of rendering is not about necessarily simulating the world, which is how I'd always approached it for film and video games. Um, but for this metaverse social context, it's about a visualization and a window into a shared reality. That just blew my mind. And I think that is the underlying key to everything we're trying to do, that we don't promise you what the pixels are. We promise you what the experience and the perception is. Okay, so there's a question from Eric on Discord. And I think it sort of ties into a little bit what you were discussing. And what it, it's about other materials and the lights given physical units and PBR rendering so that assets can move among the games. So how do you sort of handle materials? And another part of his question is, you know, what common open file format so do you work with like GLTF, USD, OBJs, things like that? Yeah, so we have we have a variety of different um, file formats that we can ingest. Uh, a lot of modeling can be just done, like we have a 3D modeler directly in our IDE. So some things are created natively in Roblox. Um, you can export them to, to common interchange formats, but you lose data because we're doing them natively as CSG trees. Um, and so if you export to a mesh, you lose the CSG, but you can import from various things. And many people export from you know, Blender or other open source tools as well as professional tools. Um, with regard to materials, so we have a we have a whole PBR system, and it, and again, it's exactly what you're saying, right? So it's about providing interchange and robustness and moving between, you know. So, so just there's some some standard. Um, there is a lot of stylized both rendering and modeling on Roblox. Um, another thing I that I want to point out, which also kind of blew my mind um, when I came to the company, was we could very easily um, render things at sort of, you know, a, a higher visual fidelity on, on high-end enthusiast desktops. 
Um, most of our users are not on those desktops. They're, they're on mobile devices. And so giving them a good experience is more important than visual fidelity. Um, but the, the thing that blew my mind was there's kind of this rule of thumb at Roblox, uh, which is the exact opposite of everything I ever did in the entertainment industry, which is that things aren't allowed to look better than they are simulated. We can't give you the false impression that there's more richness to the interactivity. And that's exactly the opposite of how most games and, and film VFX work, which is you're trying to convey and, and imply all of this richness that isn't really there in the world. So most games are not fully simulated. Almost everything is sort of locked to the world and, and totally rigid. And there's, there's no engine inside that car. There's no inside of the house. Um, Roblox goes exactly the opposite way. We're simulation first. And so except for a couple of rare cases like our ocean water, um, we essentially don't release visual features until the simulation is actually 100% there. Um, so we intentionally limit our, you know, our weather system and our particle systems and things. We, we could make really fancy VFX, but because we want emergent gameplay and we want novices to be able to understand things, not game and film experts as the content creators, we need all of that content to be real. So if there's fire in Roblox, it needs to act like real fire. If there's weather, it needs to act like real weather. It can't just be a visual representation of it. Okay. So we have a question here. How much into the functional understanding do you think it needs to go to make the automatic well, content creation meaningful for large world creation? I think that's a, that is a great question. And is, I think, one of the core questions if you go to any AI, and especially natural language con uh, processing conference these days. Um, so my personal viewpoint, which you know, might be different by tomorrow, might have been different yesterday. But right now, um, it's, I've had my mind changed a lot in that it's kind of amazing how far systems can get by pattern matching and exemplars and compressing databases. And so tasks that I thought 10 years ago, um, like natural language, like good natural language translation, um, song lyric generation, um, dialogue, conversational AI, I thought those would have needed a fairly sophisticated semantic model. And that was the direction the whole field was going for AI and, and labeling nouns and verbs and stuff. Um, and then there's been kind of this explosion, uh, both in, in image synthesis and image processing and in natural language processing of, no, if you have enough data, <laughs> it turns out there's so much redundancy in, in art, in objects, in text, um, that you can get really, really far without any understanding. So I think to make 3D models editable, there does need to be more semantic content, uh, like processing and understanding than say for you know, translating from English to French say. <clears throat> so it turns out anything I can say in English is probably, you know, some subset of that has probably already been said and, and it can be compressed into a, a big enough neural net that it can spit out the perfect French for that. Um, for 3D models, it's not so clear that everything you'd want to create, probably classes of things, right? Building, like people tend to create very similar things, but the details tend to be really different in a way that vocabularies aren't quite as diverse, I think, as the ways that 3D models can be diverse. So I think it's a hard, much harder problem to make editable 3D than doing natural language processing. Um, but the advances in NLP have convinced me that it, maybe it's not as hard as I used to think it was. <laughs> okay, so this might be our last question, but we'll see. So the big thing at the moment is the metaverse. So, you know, what do you think is the unique proposition of um, sort of metaverse platforms, let's call them? I mean, it's a pretty vague term versus, you know, traditional games like World of Warcraft. Like, I mean, we've seen these um, worlds built in Grand Theft Auto online. So we kind of already have a lot of these worlds that in some ways somehow fit into metaverse. You know, what, what do you think is the unique proposition of the different platforms and kind of what do you think is the key ingredient here? What, what really, you know, if you had a short list of what makes something a metaverse, what would it be? So it's that notion of completely separate applications that are tied together for consistency, right? So the, the web five years ago was sort of 
great and horrible. There, there were all these services that I wanted. And the problem was I needed a separate login for each one of them. And then we started to get open ID and, and login with Google and login with Amazon and all these things. Um, and it's not there yet, but it's starting to be the case that different companies, different governments, you know, different individuals can create things for the web uh, without having them be completely standalone. They can plug into an ecosystem and then they get this multiplier effect where instead of having you know, a linear number of things and it's a giant headache for me, like cable streaming subscriptions today, um, they started to come together for web applications and, and content sites so that I actually I get an advantage where once I have an account with one of these services, like my, it makes it easier to use the other service and my data already propagates. Um, so I think you know, not everything needs to be connected. Like I don't want my toaster and my thermostat online. I'm not, you know, that for me, that's not the right thing. And not every book needs to be in a series and not every movie needs to be part of like an epic thing. Um, but there are a lot of things where people do want them connected. And, you know, it would be great if I could take my character from this fighting game and I could bring them into this other one. But that's, that's sort of a kid playground thing of, you know, now I want Superman and Batman to fight or something. And it turns out that, you know, by building these metaverse platforms, you can enable that kind of creativity, um, that kind of productivity for, you know, that we've seen for business and web applications that I think we could bring that to 3D and embodied 3D. And I think, frankly, one of the reasons that it, it's been a challenge, um, there's been amazing tech on the VR side, um, but there hasn't been sort of a compelling business and consumer model for why you would want that tech. And as an enthusiast, I don't care, I just buy every VR headset, but I get it that most of my friends you know, they want to know what, what would I do with this? So I think one of the things that's always held back um, sort of the 3D web, there've been various attempts at this and that's been holding back VR is that embodied is incredibly powerful, but you need something to be able to do. And the best thing to be able to do is everything you do in the real world, but without friction. So if we can get school and banking and entertainment and video games and poker night and conferences um, to come to sort of, a metaverse, then it's not, I need 15 accounts to do this. It's I just show up as myself and everything just works. And I think that'll enable these huge classes of applications. So to me, that's the power of the metaverse. It's the non-dystopian aspects of, you know, Neil Stevenson and William Gibson and, and, and all of these, these famous um, sort of seventies and eighties writers. And, you know, that that's the vision that I care about is, is embodied social 3D that's, that's instantaneous and frictionless. Sounds exciting. <laughs> um, I'll, I'm going to do one more question, then I think we'll have to go to break. Uh, you mentioned a few promising future representations, such as nerfs and implicits, and um, I wonder whether there are bottlenecks that prevent us from using those representations. Yeah, definitely. That's that's why um, this this collaborative group of us has been doing a lot of research on it. Is this tremendous? So meshes are terrible for machine learning. They're, they're from a geometric perspective, they're not differentiable anywhere. Um, and so, and neural nets are based on being able to differentiate for backpropagation. So having something that's like constant or has a vanishing derivative and edge everywhere is a bad idea. Um, but they're also not differentiable in a more serious sense of meshes are very digital. They're very fragile. You change a couple bits in an index triangle mesh and you've just got garbage. Um, so, the, so you want something with a more analog sense of robustness, that it can degrade, that it can be compressed, that it can be combined in ways where sort of degrading or squishing the bits or, you know, hill climbing to sort of learn a shape where if the bits are close, the shape is close. And so neural nets have that property in general, that they, they degrade much more gracefully. Um, the problem is the approaches like Nerf are extremely brute force. They, they're ray marching a volume. They're, they're like classic, um, you know, medical imaging style volumetric rendering, which is amazing, but not if you have a four-year-old Android phone on a, you know, 3G connection. And, and then it's sort of, this is completely impractical compared to triangle mesh rasterization. So what we've been trying to do is, is take the, the good things we're finding from the ML community and bring our graphics know-how to that. So things like, hey, instead of a, grid, maybe an octree would be a good idea. That, that's a nice way of getting rid of empty space. Um, instead of you know, storing this volumetrically over all of space, maybe we store volumetrically uh, assigned distance function. And then there are great algorithms for sort of in log time finding the actual intersections rather than linear time and the length of the volume. 
Um, and then things like, you know, how do you want materials to map like parameterizations? Should they be solid models? Should they be surface parameterizations? So I think there's a, there's a lot of great stuff that's, um, you know, essentially a lot of my research agenda is taking things that I'm seeing as emerging technologies in, in AI and natural language processing and distributed systems, and then matching those with what we already know about the metaverse domain from computer graphics. Um, but using their new innovations and putting those together. So I, I think that's a great way to attack these three challenges of the scaling community and creativity. Okay. Well, I think we better wrap it up. Um, so thanks again, Morgan. It was a fantastic talk. And we'll be back in, we'll go to a break now and we'll be back in five minutes for the image-based algorithms session. Okay.